The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. Do you think you're smart enough to commit a murder? Do you think you have enough intelligence of how to get rid of a body, how to avoid the police, how to evade suspicion? Two men in particular asked these questions, and their names were Leopold and Loeb. Nathan Leopold was born on November 19, 1904, in Chicago. He was born in the lap of luxury. Both of his parents were incredibly wealthy, and he was also described as a child prodigy. He claimed to have spoken his first words at the age of four, and by his late teens, he knew 15 languages and spoke five fluently. He would earn his bachelor's degree in ornithology at the University of Chicago, and the research that he performed there was nationally recognized. Richard Loeb was born on June 11, 1905 in Chicago. He was also from a wealthy family and was observed by his teachers to be exceptionally intelligent, so much so that he skipped many grades and became University of Michigan's youngest, at the time, graduate. He was 17 years old. He would then study law at the University of Chicago Law School, and this is where he got the idea to construct the perfect murder. Leopold and Loeb knew each other casually as children, but their friendship didn't bud until they met each other in college. Their relationship flourished in University of Chicago, and they would speak to each other about the things that they were learning. Richard Loeb would command these conversations because he was studying law, and these men had the shared interest of constructing the perfect crime. But on occasion, their conversations would drift to philosophy, and in the book Leopold and Loeb Trial, written by Douglas O'Linder, he would describe a conversation between Leopold and Loeb that marked the beginning of their plan to kill someone. Leopold was particularly fascinated by Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of supermen, or Ubermenschen, interpreting them as transcendent individuals possessing extraordinary and unusual capabilities, whose superior intellects allowed them to rise above the laws and rules that bound the unimportant, average populace. Leopold believed that he and Loeb were such individuals, and as such, by his interpretation of Nietzsche's doctrines, they were not bound by any of society's normal ethics or rules. Nearly immediately after Leopold and Loeb had this philosophical awakening, they chose to plan the murder of Bobby Franks. Leopold and Loeb spent seven months planning everything to the T from how they're going to dispose the body, how they're going to abduct someone, and even deciding to make a ransom and specific instructions on how to collect the ransom to make sure that they will never be caught. The pair decided on Bobby Franks because he was from an affluent family as well. They anticipated getting a healthy ransom as a result of this abduction, but they had no intentions of returning Bobby Franks alive. The plan began on May 21st, 1924. Using an automobile that Leopold rented under the name Morton D. Ballard, they offered Franks a ride as soon as he walked home from school. Bobby Franks initially refused. His home was only a few blocks away, so he wouldn't need a car ride. But Loeb persuaded him to enter the car to discuss a tennis racket that they'd been using. The precise sequence of events that followed remains in dispute, but major opinion places Leopold behind the wheel while Loeb sat in the back of the seat with a chisel. Loeb then struck Franks with the chisel sitting in front of him in the passenger seat several times in the head and then dragged him to the back seat where he gagged him and then he died. The two men then covered the child in hydrochloric acid in order to obfuscate his identity. After that, they sent this ransom note with detailed instructions on how to drop the money and what to do next in order to see their son alive. Ironically, if they hadn't have sent a ransom note, they probably would never have been caught. You see, after the parents received the ransom note, they attempted to follow the instructions, but they were so distressed about their child's abduction that they just did it incorrectly. They went to the drop-off spot and found no one there. It was completely abandoned. They knew that it was a setup. They knew that their child wasn't alive. After the ransom failed, Leopold and Loeb just vanished. But this wouldn't last long. Within the next week, they were both bragging about what they did, saying that they got away with murder. And when they were inevitably approached by police officers, they pointed the finger at each other, and they both received 99 years in prison. Loeb would die five years later in a prison murder, with the motive being relatively unknown. Leopold would be released from prison 33 years later, and go on to write a book about how his perfect murder failed.
Dihydrogen sulfate, also known as sulfuric acid, is a corrosive chemical known for its ability to oxidize and break down organic material. While sulfuric acid is naturally occurring, its purest form needs to be manufactured, and unfortunately, that concentrated version of sulfuric acid is readily available to the public, and subsequently becomes available to awful people. This is Mark Van Dongen. His friends describe him as a loving and caring person. One friend in particular described him as a gentle man and everyone's friend. And around 2010, Van Dongen met and began a relationship with this woman. Her name is Berlia Wallace, and they struck up a pretty close relationship. Although Van Dongen was smitten with his new girlfriend, his friends noticed something sinister. You see, Berlia Wallace was 20 years his senior, and a lot of his friends noticed how she was using him. She really didn't care about him. And after five years, the relationship began to break down. Van Dongen started noticing her manipulative behavior. Van Dongen chose to end the relationship and began seeing another woman. This enraged Berlia Wallace. She no longer could control him. And as a response to him leaving her, Berlia Wallace goes onto Amazon and purchases a one liter bottle of sulfuric acid. She quickly removed the label and researched acid attacks. And from that research, she learned how to efficiently and swiftly attack her ex-boyfriend. Interestingly, the day that she purchased the acid, Van Doggen called the police and told them that Belia was stalking and harassing him, along with intimidating his new girlfriend. Unfortunately, Van Doggen still had to share a flat with his ex-girlfriend. This is when Berlia Wallace waited until Van Doggen was asleep. She would creep into his bedroom and throw acid on his face while he slept. The prosecutor had this to say during the court case. You chose your moment for the attack. It occurred when Van Dongen, wearing only boxer shorts, was asleep in the bed which you had shared in your flat. Vulnerable, almost naked, he awoke but had no real opportunity to avoid the focus of your acid attack, namely his face and body. When concentrated sulfuric acid encounters human flesh, it immediately decomposes the proteins and lipids found on your skin, along with leaving an extensive burn because sulfuric acid, when reacting with organic compounds like flesh, releases a lot of heat. The reaction is instant, and Mark Van Dongen got the brunt of it. He lost sight in his left eye, and the majority of his face is disfigured. The trial judge, after the sentencing was read, had this to say. Your intention was to burn, disfigure, and disable Mark Van Dongen so that he would not be attractive to any other woman. It was an act of pure evil. After doctors were able to stabilize Mark and examine his entire body, they realized that not only his face was attacked with acid, but 25% of his body was attacked with acid. She basically poured the bottle out on him. The doctors and nurses didn't know what had hit them, his father said. They didn't have a suitable ward because of the way that he looked. That caused problems, but he was admitted. They examined him, cleaned him, and we went straight to the palliative care unit. He was given excellent care. I had a beautiful home at the time. I said to Mark, come with me. He said, Dad, that would just be another ceiling to look at. After the trial concluded, Berlia Wallace was sentenced to 12 years in prison. And after the trial, Mark Van Dongen's health began to decline, and in Belgium, they allow their patients to choose whether or not they want to be euthanized. Mark chose to be euthanized. He simply didn't want to continue his life in pain, and chose to euthanize himself on January 2nd, 2017. I want you guys to close your eyes and imagine yourself in 1960s South Africa. Maybe you're walking down the street of Cape Town and you're thinking of maybe going to the beach, or maybe you're gonna see your friends in Pretoria, who knows? But you're just living your life. But then you encounter this sign, and this is a new sign by the South African Ministry of Justice. It's a new update to apartheid laws. Depending on who you are, these laws may not apply to you, and that was their function. It was to separate you from undesirables, from the native population. This poster, made by the African Ministry of Justice, contained the major rules that an African native would have to follow. It also includes guidelines for British and Afrikaners on how to interact and deal with the native population and colored population, those of mixed race heritage. Anyone disobeying these laws will be imprisoned, fined, and or whipped. All Africans over the age of 16 must produce a passbook on demand by a policeman. No white person may have sexual relations with an African, colored, or Indian person, and vice versa. Under no circumstances may an employer pay Africans the same rate as white persons, even if they do the same work and work the same hours. 
No African may attend a birthday party if the number attending could make the gathering undesirable. No African may strike for any reason whatsoever. An African in an urban area who is out of work must take work offered to him by the Bureau Affairs Commissioner or be removed from the area. Any African who takes a job outside his town, even if he has lived there for 20 years, must leave that town within 72 hours. No African may buy land or own property anywhere in the Republic. Unless they have obtained a special permit to do so, a white person and a non-white person may not under any circumstances drink a cup of tea together in a cafe. Under no circumstances may a non-white person use facilities set aside for the use of white persons, and no white man may teach an African servant to read. These are the many apartheid laws that existed during the British occupation of South Africa, and they were all meant to suppress the majority African population in that nation. Apartheid existed for the sole protection of the minority European population in that nation, and without it, the European population were vulnerable to revolution. In the United States, there is approximately 12 million immigrants, 10.7 million of which would be considered illegal immigrants. The term illegal immigrant classifies many different types of document status. Most people who are considered illegal immigrants are those who have overstayed their visa or simply do not have American citizenship. These two individuals are Cuban immigrants. This man's name is Leobert Santos Correa. This woman's name is Eldeviz Martinez Aguilar. And they're a couple. They wanted to leave Cuba together and enter the United States through Miami, Florida. And typically the way that's done is by employing coyotes or people smugglers. And these people smugglers take advantage of those who employ them by charging high fees or simply robbing them and leaving them in a desert or in the middle of the ocean. A similar thing occurred with this couple. In 2016, they paid three Colombians to smuggle them via boat to Miami. But instead of taking them there, they killed them. Eldeviz Martinez Aguilar spent the last minutes of her life being repeatedly assaulted by two of them before having her throat slit. The smugglers who killed the couple were named Freddy's Valencia Palacios, 30, and Hoen Steven Carizala Asparilla, 23. They were immediately caught after they killed the couple, and they were extradited by the U.S. government back to Cuba. In 2019, they were sent to prison for an unknown amount of time for killing this couple. Do you think you'd ever participate in a mob lynching? Do you think you'd ever be infuriated enough to take justice into your own hands and participate in a lynching with a group of people? In the United States, lynchings were incredibly common during the early 20th century. Unfortunately, they were used against minority groups as a means of oppression. Many race riots of the late 19th century and early 20th century would always culminate in a lynching. Over time, even during the 20th century, lynchings became less and less popular. The publication of images of lynched individuals really stuck in the mind of the American public. People began to question whether or not those who had been lynched were actually guilty of the crimes that they were accused of. It was also hard to ignore that the majority of people being lynched were minorities, majority of those being African Americans. The Ku Klux Klan in particular, a white supremacist group in the United States, would target African American communities and lynch those who they thought committed crimes against the white community. Many of these lynchings were classified as tacit homicides, and many Ku Klux Klan members were arrested and tried for murder. This is Michael Donald. Born July 24, 1961, he lived in Mobile, Alabama. He was the youngest of six children, and he attended local schools while growing up. After graduating, he would attend a local technical college and study there, all while being employed at the Mobile Press Register, a local newspaper. In the same year, an African-American man named Josephus Anderson was charged with murder of a white policeman in Birmingham, Alabama. The policeman caught Anderson committing an armed robbery, and Anderson reacted by shooting him. Anderson's case was being tried in Mobile, and at a meeting held in Mobile, while the jury was still deliberating, members of the Ku Klux Klan chimed in saying that the reason why Anderson wasn't being convicted is because the jury was predominantly black. Bernie Jack, a high-ranking member of the Ku Klux Klan, had this to say, If a black man can get away with killing a white man, we ought to be able to get away with killing a black man. The first trial, unfortunately, ended with a deadlock of the mixed white-black jury. Anderson's case was retired and ended in a mistrial. Once the news about the mistrial entered the public, the local Ku Klux Klan had a meeting about how they were going to retaliate. Three men in particular, named Henry Hayes, his son, and another man named James Llewellyn, got into a car and drove around mobile looking for a black person to attack in retaliation. 
They were armed with a gun and equipped with a rope borrowed from Frank Cox, Hayes' brother-in-law. They were driving through predominantly black neighborhoods, and unfortunately they spotted Michael Donald. He was walking down the street, coming from a convenience store after purchasing cigarettes. Without any link to the Anderson case or even a past criminal record, Donald was chosen at random for being black. The two clan members lured him over to their car by asking him for directions to a local club and forced Donald into the car at gunpoint. The men then drove out to another county and took him to a secluded area in the woods near Mobile Bay. Michael attempted to escape, knocking away Hayes' gun and trying to run into the woods. The men pursued him, attacked him, and then beat him with a tree limb. This slowed Michael down. They then wrapped a rope around Michael's neck and then pulled it to strangle him while Knowles continued to beat Donald with a tree branch. Once Donald had stopped moving, Hayes slit his throat three times to make sure he was dead. The men left Donald's lifeless body hanging from a tree on Henderson Avenue across the street from Hayes' house in Mobile, where it remained until the next morning. The same night, the other clan members burned a cross on Mobile County's courthouse lawn to celebrate the murder. After the body was discovered the next morning, the local police immediately suspected the clan. This is because of the remark they made during Anderson's trial. The police initially thought that it was a drug deal gone wrong. Michael Donald's mother, Belia May Donald, insisted that he never had done drugs before and claimed that the police simply just wanted to close the case. She requested the help of a prominent civil rights activist at the time, Jesse Jackson. He was able to convince the FBI to open an investigation, and subsequently, all who were involved in the lynching were caught. It took around two years for the entire investigation to be completed, and Henry Francis Hayes was convicted of capital murder. The jury voted in favor of life imprisonment, but the judge overruled the jury's verdict and sentenced Hayes to death. He was incarcerated in the Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore, Alabama while on death row. Hayes was executed on Yellow Mama, Alabama's infamous electric chair, on June 6, 1997. Once the execution was completed, the Associated Press reported that Hayes was the first execution since 1913 for a white on black crime. Hayes is also known as the only Ku Klux Klan member to ever been executed in the 20th century for the murder of an African American. James Llewellyn was indicted by a federal grand jury in 1985 for violating the civil rights of Michael Donald, and pleaded guilty for the civil rights violations in the United States District Court for Southern District of Alabama. Knowles avoided the death penalty by testifying against Hayes, Cox, and other Klansmen at the trial, and he had earlier testified that the slaying was done to show the true strength of the Klan in Alabama. This is Lina Marcela Medina de Juado, born on the 23rd of September 1933 in Peru. She was one of nine children, and at the age of five, her parents took her to the hospital in Pisco, Peru, due to her stomach and general abdominal region increasing in size at a rapid rate. Doctors originally thought that she had a tumor, but then determined that she was in her seventh month of pregnancy. This was obviously jarring for the doctors examining her, and they took many x-rays and proved that she was, in fact, pregnant. Once the news got out that a five-year-old girl was pregnant, many people were interested in the case. Many newspapers and film producers asked and petitioned the family for exclusive rights to their story, and one film producer in particular reached out with a $5,000 offer for film rights. These offers were all rejected, rightfully so, because Lena Medina was five years old and was about to give birth to a child. Six weeks after the diagnosis, Medina gave birth to a boy by cesarean section. She was five years, seven months, and 21 days old, the youngest person in history to give birth. The cesarean birth was necessitated by her small pelvis, and the doctors found out that she had fully mature sexual organs, even though she was only five. Her baby boy weighed 6 pounds, or 2.7 kilograms, and he was raised believing that Medina was his sister, and at the age of 10, he found out that actually, she was his mother. And even to this day, the identity of the father is still unknown. Medina's father was suspected of child abuse and was arrested, but there was no evidence that he had abused his daughter. He would soon be released from police custody, and Lena Medina raised her son by herself, and in 1979, at the age of 40, her son would die from bone marrow disease. In 2018, the city of Baltimore had a homicide rate of 58 people per 100,000. That placed Baltimore in one of the most deadly cities in the United States at that time, and this boy contributed one innocent soul to that rate. His name is Tyrone Harvin, 
and he's 14 years old, and he is the youngest suspect that the city police has ever charged with murder in the past two decades. This is Dorothy Nay Neal, 83 years old. There isn't a lot of information on her, but what is known is that she was his neighbor, and Tyrone Harvin chose her to be his victim. Uh, back on uh, August 29th, she was assaulted inside of her home in the 2300 block of Winchester Street in West Baltimore, um, and she died the next day, August 30th. What we found in that case was that she had been assaulted, um, uh, physically assaulted, um, we also were able to determine after the autopsy that she was also sexually assaulted. Um, uh, and, and again, um, when we talk about vulnerable, our vulnerable population, um, our older people um, especially, uh, but we also talk about youth as vulnerable people. Um, 70 years, almost 70 years separate our victim and suspect in this case. Um, the suspect in this case is 14 years old. Um, Tyrone Harvin has been charged with first-degree murder, first-degree rape, various sex offenses. Uh, we were able to find physical evidence that linked him to the crime, and um, he has been charged with that crime. Um, again, I know that there are some who ask why uh, we, we charge as an adult, that's the law. Um, and part of the law is uh, releasing pictures of those who are charged with crimes, and that's our obligation in this. Um, this is certainly not a happy occasion to um, announce an arrest and a murder, it never is. Um, obviously good work, but it's sad all the way around because there's some uh, systematic failure in a 14-year-old's life to allow us to have to be up here talking about him being accused of murder. In Baltimore City, when a child commits egregious crimes, like Tyrone Harvin, he could petition the court to have his jail sentence be served at a rehabilitation center. That privilege was denied to Tyrone Harvin. His charges are unknown because he was a minor when he committed this crime, but it's presumed that he will be in prison for a very, very, very long time. I truly believe messages, memories, sayings, beliefs are better conveyed on canvas than text or regular speech. Something about an artist's rendition of a specific message or a historical moment adds more insight and depth than a regular piece of text can provide. I can write a 10-page chronological paper about World War II, but this man, Zora Musik, has the talent to convey the same message in the most authentic way, by depicting what happened during that time. Zoran Musik, born on the 12th of February 1909, was a Slovene painter, printmaker, and draughtsman. He was the only painter of Slovene descent who managed to establish himself in elite cultural circles of Italy and France, particularly in Paris in the second half of the 20th century, where he lived most of his later life. And the next paintings you're going to see are his depictions of the Holocaust, specifically the Dachau concentration camp. When I first encountered his work, I noticed that a lot of his paintings that depict something negative are smudgy. They're made with imprecise brushwork, and it's creepy, it's uncanny, especially when he includes characters that are screaming or clawing at their face or lying on top of each other. This image in particular depicts a pile of dead bodies. These bodies are being prepared for incineration, and you can hardly discern individual faces, yet you know they're human bodies. They're stiff, stacked on top of each other. Arms, legs, fingers are jutting out randomly. This image in particular has very little detail, but just enough for you to understand what you're looking at. You're looking at depravity. You're looking at tragedy. You're looking at murder. You're looking at innocent people, innocent souls that were snuffed out during the most gruesome and deadliest time in all of human history.
Hello, hello everyone, it's your boy Aleris, aka Panda Daddy, and I hope you enjoyed this week's content. I had a whole lot of nice stuff lined up for you, I hope you enjoyed it. I know you guys have been waiting for more reality for a while now, and I hope you guys are satisfied with today's episode. I really wanted to make sure it was special, but I have some really good news for you guys. Aleris After Hours, my second channel, will be retrofitted to be a true crime and dark history channel. Yeah, so I'm working on some content right now that's going to be uploaded to the Patreon first, so everybody who's on the Patreon is going to see the first three episodes that will be uploaded onto Aleris After Hours. If you want to see those episodes coming next week, feel free to uh, sign up on my Patreon and you'll be able to watch them. This decision came about from a Twitter poll. I was curious if you guys would want to have a channel dedicated to morbid reality content and a lot of you guys are interested in that i also put out this tweet looking for artists who could help me design the channel to make it look a little bit more dark and spooky or whatever so if you have that type of talent and if you're interested in t uh, potentially working with me to make sure that channel looks great feel free to reach out to me on my twitter and or instagram and as always gotta thank the patreon supporters that make content like this possible a big thank you to Zach, Darth, Fafnir Stuff, Keeley, Dunder Has Hawk, Clyde the Hobo, The Fourth Lick, Caroline Banana, A Generic Fox Fur, Viva LaRue, I Didn't Bought My Viewers True, Julian, Benny's Big Bean Burrito, Nobs, Lady Laughs A Lot, Swiss Patreon User, Muffy Lou Who, Noah, Vermont, John Robinson, Eva, and Catherine Taylor. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one of my merch store and one of my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.